Well, hello! It's time for another exciting episode of Pens in Use. This is the show where I talk about the fountain pens and inks I've been using throughout the week. So, let's dive into it. If videos like this interest you, where I talk about fountain pens and inks, both new and old, and at all price points, I would invite you to subscribe. And, got any comments about this bad boy? Let us know down in the comments. So let's dive into the pens. Alright, so these are the pens that I've been using throughout the week. So I have uh, my Mumble 32, a Mumble 225, hey! <laughs> Lamy 2000, do you notice some similarity there? So I'm going to compare them a little bit. Uh, Pilot Justice 95, Pilot E95, and I'm not sure what the 95 means there. So I have to research that. I just realized that as I'm filming the video. So yeah. <laughs> A Nakaya Decapod Twist, which is gorgeous. Um, Senator President, thanks to ODE, I decided to pull this one out. Um, I have my Artisan Pens Segura, Seguro, just a second. I can't remember the vowel that ends the name of that pen. Okay, Cigarro, there we go. <laughs> uh, and finally the Birmingham Pens Model A. So, I had some fun filming these. I, uh, not a lot of vintage this week, but, uh, Definitely some fun pens this week, so let's take a look at them. As always, I'll be doing my writing sample in this Cognitive Surplus Notebook with the seafood flavoring. Alright, so uh, I'm just going to mention last week somebody told me that I'd kind of overexposed, so I, I cut back on my lighting, but I'm also filming at a different time of day this week, so we'll see how it goes. But my first pen is this beautiful Mont Blanc 32. It's a vintage pen from the 1960s. You know, I don't own any modern mobile pens because, well, I can't afford them. I guess I could use YouTube money, but there are so many more fun pens I could buy with that YouTube money that, yeah, I'd rather not. Has a fun fingernail type nib. Interesting ink window. And one thing I've discovered with this pen this week is uh, when it sits upright in my pocket, the uh, feed drains out and then I get a hard start. But no hard starts today because it's been laying horizontal. Horizontal, there's no problem. Uh, the ink in it is Califolio, which is a great brand if you're using uh, vintage pens. It's vintage friendly, but it has some fun different colors in it. So I'm using Califolio Noir. So I had some people mention they don't like the looks of the new swatches. I tend to agree. I like my old swatches better. Uh, I may try a uh, you know, different way of arranging these strokes. But the reason I did this is because of the oblique thing. Um, I'm trying to remember if... I don't think any of my pens this week have an oblique nib. But I did notice it makes a difference for the oblique thing. Because oblique nibs, of course, are cut at a slant. So they uh, definitely express themselves very differently. You know, one thing that has occurred to me is... Okay, let's just show you. One of the thoughts I had after reading that person's comments was... What if I do my swatches like this? You know, I can do my horizontal strokes... My vertical strokes, my uh, whatever these are, and my obliqueness strokes. Or, like I'll show you in the next swatch, I, I you know I could do them a little differently too. There's all kinds of possibilities. So yeah, I'd be, I'm kind of curious to hear what you think. This next pen was the one that I used in my. Uh, uh, suddenly drawn a blank. <laughs> First impressions this week. A mobile 225. Now it's worth noting that this pen looks an awful lot like 
the finish on the Lamy 2000. Now, the nibs are not the same, but uh, yeah, they're both Macrolon pens, which is a type of plastic used in a bulletproof, um, what are they called? Bulletproof something, anyway. Uh, the Lamy 2000 goes for a steel section. The Mont Blanc goes for a more plastic section, but uh, they both do the ears. The Mont Blanc has extra ears, but uh, yeah. And the Lamy 2000 goes for a semi-hooded nib, whereas this Mont Blanc goes for a more exposed nib. Worth noting, they both do a great job hiding their piston turning knob. So let's take a look at the Mont Blanc. Got to get on the right line here. Mont Blanc. Two twenty-five. Yes, this has an extra fine nib as well. I actually really enjoy this pen. I uh, I was so thrilled with it the first time I wrote with it, and uh, it has not disappointed since. And the ink in this pen is Waterman, thanks to a pen pal. Oh, shoot. Okay, so <laughs> that scared the heck out of me. <laughs> so uh, uh, the last time I got interrupted, it was by a Daniel Green novel. I got interrupted by a Daniel, Gr not novel, video. I got interrupted by a Daniel Green video this time, but instead of Daniel Green, I got the advertising before the video. I don't know why that decided to start going in the middle of me talking, but it did. I don't know why it started to go last time, but yeah. I, I, I watched Daniel Green, and uh, I'm trying to do my own book reviews, but I am no Daniel Green, so uh, got a long ways to go. But I, I his style is not mine. I just enjoy watching him, so anyway. I was talking about pens, wasn't I? Something about Waterman ink. So let's go back to the ink. Oh my god. Alright, so <clears throat> anyway, Pen Pal sent me a bunch of ink. Uh, this is Waterman Absolute Brown. So yeah, he sent me a bunch of different Waterman samples. And this is one of them. So we'll see what I think. Uh... I haven't had this in a pen very long, so honestly, my opinions aren't very well developed. I'm not much of a fan of brown inks. I kind of like, you know, color versus Jupiter flyby, but, you know, as for other browns, eh. You know, this one's okay. It's just, you know, not really anything special. It's a brown. It's a decent brown. It's just nothing, eh, nothing special. So I promised you a reattempt at the uh, swatch that was more uh, square. So one of the things that occurred to me is, what if you do this? You know, you do your two solid swatches in each corner, and then you go your vertical horizontals in one corner. And you do your oblique tests in the other corner. So, I don't know. I, I, I kind of like if I'm going to go with it. I like this one better. The only reason I went with the diagonals is I just thought... And, and this is purely emotional because physically it's not possible. But I felt like it gave me more real estate for each swatch. Even though it really doesn't. So, I don't know. I just thought it was kind of fun. On that note, we'll go to the Lamy 2000. Uh, this is not my fine nib pen, because the Mont Blanc 32 is taking that role this week. This is my broad Lamy 2000. So this is another one of those Waterman inks that uh, my pen pal sent me. 
So this is Waterman. Uh, tender purple. So for this week, I'll just continue with the same diagonal swatches. I'll now we'll see what people think. So vertical strokes, yeah, th this is a very stubby type of nib. Oh, horizontal strokes. Diagonal strokes. They actually have an oblique broad nib. They have an oblique double broad. So uh, someday I might have to experiment with those. But for now, I'm, I'm pretty happy with what I have. For my next pen, last week I showed you the uh, soft setting, and that's mostly what I did. So this is a Pilot Justice 95. This week, I'm going to do most of my writing with the hard, hard setting. If you're curious, Oh wait, there it is. That's last week. So let's see what I get with the hard setting. So it's the Pilot Justice 95 with the hard fine setting. And the ink in it is Colorverse. Pale blue dot. So to do the ink swatch, we'll start with the vertical. I am so messy tonight, I don't know why, but I am. Vertical swatch. Uh, the diagonal swatch. It's not oblique, so yeah, don't get your hopes up. And the uh, other swatch. <laughs> so uh, just for fun, I'm going to write with uh, the the uh, soft setting underneath this. And, you know, I just feel more expansive and ready to go with the uh, soft setting. So, for whatever that's worth, I uh, I like this pen a lot. I uh, One year I even made it one of my top ten pens, back when I used to do top ten pen reviews. But uh, I got really criticized for that. And, you know, it's kind of fair because it was the gimmick that was making it my top ten and really... Is the gimmick that special? No. It, it, it makes a little difference in how it writes, but not a whole lot. All right, this is my Pilot E95. Of course, it has a medium nib. And the ink in it is Roshizuku. Mirasaki Shikabu. Which is just a really attractive purple. I, uh, I like it a little bit better than that Waterman purple that's up above here. Although I'm surprised by how well I like that Waterman purple. It is not as horrific as I imagine. You know, I, I had never used Waterman's inks before they were sent to me uh, by this pen pal. But, uh, you know, really none of them have been as bad as I expected. Which uh, is sad because I like some of my Waterman's pens. So why did I have such low expectations of their inks? And I, I cannot answer that. My next pen is the lovely Nakaya Decapod Twist. 
Recently, I learned that my parents have discovered my channel, which uh, they got high-speed internet this winter. Uh, it finally became available where they live, so uh, make of that what you will. But, you know, it's kind of embarrassing. Um, thankfully, I can use the excuse of, yeah, it was channel income that paid for this, because, yeah, I could not justify this pen on what I make. My parents are very frugal, but, uh, you know, I, uh, I just decided, you know, whatever money I make with this channel is going to get invested in the channel, whether it's equipment or uh, pens. And since I have decent equipment, uh, it's become pens the last few years. Nakaya Decapod Twist. So this has a soft, fine nib. Uh, actually, probably in the next year, I'll be buying fewer pens. Because, uh, you know, with presidential election over, my income is going to drop. So this is Grunmarkt Smaragd. Okay, I don't know if it's the weather or what, but my desk is making weird noises against the wall today. It does not normally do that, so... I don't... Like I said, I don't know if it's the weather, or if the desk is about to fall off the wall, or what the heck is going on, but... I'm not liking it. But I am liking how this pen writes. This soft fine is a pretty amazing nib. Uh, if you don't want to pay the uh, Nakaya premium, you can get the exact same nib if you buy a Platinum 3776 in a soft fine. So last night I was, uh, I got to be part of ODE's most recent video. He, he doesn't do a pens in use every week. He does like a once a month, here's the pens I'm going to use this month. Um, but... He made a remark about Waterman, what is it called? Waterman Harmonious Green. And he said, yeah, I don't like, I like Waterman inks, but I don't like Waterman Harmonious Green. And I'm just like, oh, but I just put it in a pen this week. And I'm actually going to reference one of his videos later, so I feel bad. <laughs> so this is a Senator President. So it's a German pen, a vintage pen, because uh, they don't make pens like this anymore. Now they just make up uh, ballpoints, but, you know, at one time they made some very beautiful fountain pens. And this one has some, uh, oops, Ukrainian on it for the Ministry of Coal. Um, well, what was it, a year or two ago, I got arrested temporarily. Uh, got questioned by some lady named Nancy and this orange guy both about this Ukrainian thing. I'm like, I don't know. It's just a pen, dudes and ladies. But anyway, the ink in this is Waterman. Harmonious Green. And you know, ODE said he doesn't like this ink. But I have to say, that's attractive. I like it. So I don't know if I'm about to be banned from Portugal or what, but uh, I'm not seeing the problem here. I think that is a really nice shade of green. You know, it could be just the pen I'm using it in. I don't know, but uh, yeah. So uh, if I end up in the uh, gulags of Lisbon, you'll know it's because I uh, said nice things about this ink. Fun fact, uh, Lisbon, North Dakota, was looking for a science teacher this year. And for a brief, I don't know, 30 seconds I thought about it. But I don't see where it's an improvement over where I'm at, except for being closer to Fargo. So, didn't take it. All right, this next one is a handmade pen from Australia. This is by uh, JPL, the uh, famous... Australian pen YouTuber. Although lately he's been kind of interesting. He's not been talking about pens so much. He's been talking more about uh, tools. And I found that actually kind of interesting. 
So this is the artisan pens. I just wrote air. Artisan pens. Um, Cigarro. Uh, the nib in it, oops, cigar, oh, not ah. The nib in it is a broad Asian nib, which I really don't remember what that means, but that's what the nib is. The ink in it is another one of those nice uh, Waterman inks that I was sent. So this is Waterman Serenity Blue which I just noticed on the screen I misspelled because I put an E where this I is. So I need to fix that before I publish this video. But it's Waterman Serenity Blue. So we'll do the vertical strokes. It just looks like a nice dark blue to me. A really nice dark blue actually here we'll do our oblique strokes and here okay so okay what makes that nib special again I really don't know I'm kind of struggling to figure that one out And my next pen, my final pen actually, is this very lovely Birmingham Pens Model A. And I can't explain why, but it ticks all my boxes. And as a bonus, it's made in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And if you've been following this channel, you know that Pennsylvania is my home state. So that's exciting. And oh, check it out. Not exactly one of my vintage Bach nibs, but it does have a double broad Nima sign nib in it. So this is a Birmingham Pens. Ooh, yellow. And it's a yellow that works. So this is a Birmingham Pens Model A, double broad. And the ink in it is a sample sent to me about a year ago by a viewer who just thought, you know, you really need to try all these Krishna inks, which are from uh, um, India. I only have a few more to go. <laughs> so I'm glad I tried this one. This is definitely going on my short list of inks to buy if I ever buy ink ever again because it is a very nice yellow you know I, I tried Krishna's Kanakona yellow and oh boy was that crust delicious but so far no crusties on this pen at least uh, you know I should mention that the pen is one of the variables there so it could be this pen is just better with uh, crusty inks than uh, some of my others all right, so those are the pens and inks I've been using this week. I'm going to come into the light. <laughs> Let's see if my focus is still good. I just realized I was out of the light for that whole introduction. But anyway, um, one of the things that came up this week, I had a comment about that light right there. Now, if I'm in the mood, it can do all kinds of fun things. I can adjust the speed on that. I can adjust the brightness. Uh, there are zillions of different settings I can do. You know, some very fun ones. And I, I actually really enjoy looking at them. Um, I, I run this light even when I'm not filming. But I'm putting it back to this setting because I had an interesting comment from a viewer that uh, as a, ed, a professional educator really spoke to my soul. If, you know, I believed in souls. <laughs> Um, so he mentioned that, oops, wrong button. <laughs> this kind of thing is really distracting to him to watch me. 
And you know what? He's got a point. Now, he was talking about visual difficulties. You know, I guess there are some issues with eyesight there. But uh, I'm going to tell you something about me as an educator. If you walk into my classroom, it's a science room. And at first, you know, there's a bit of sensory overload because that's how science rooms are. There's lab equipment everywhere. There's stored stuff and whatever. There's lab tables and so on. But you're not going to see a lot of decoration in my room. I have a big evolution poster. And I have a poster about, um, you know, kind of our school, one of our school things. And then I've got, you know, the lunch menu and that's about it. I don't decorate my room. Now, why don't I decorate my room? Well, because I realized years and years ago, I have students who are easily distracted by stuff. And the more decoration there is, the more they're distracted. The more mess there is, and yes, there have been various points where I've had a messy classroom, uh, the more distracted they are. And uh, I just realized that Students focus better the less uh, visual, let's say, visual clutter there is. And this thing, when it's going, not like that, <laughs> when it's going the full strobe light thing, that could be a little distracting. So uh, this person isn't suffering from that difficulty. It's not an attention thing. It is a, a visual thing. But they had a good point. It just said, oh, wow, I never thought about that. So, um, I'm really glad they brought it to my attention. You know, now they mentioned that I could probably have this fade between colors if I wanted to, but uh, I got it to do it once, but I haven't gotten it to do it again, so I'm not sure how to do that unless I sit here going... You know, I, I could do that, I suppose. Maybe without you seeing my hand. But uh, anyway, wow, really good point. So I thank you for that. Did it just fade? Sorry, I, I'm looking at this. And, and, and I just realized that, uh, you know, when I hold it in my hand like this, I am touching it. So, whoops. So how about if I set it down for this discussion and uh, we'll just go with whatever color is up there. But anyway, I just thought, I think I just found how, how to get it to fade from color to color. Oh my God. Well, serendipity strikes. <laughs> but anyway, so they said that, which I just happened to have stumbled on by accident, would be a much better background. And uh, yeah, I think they're right. So, uh, I want to thank them for bringing that to my attention because it matches my experience as an educator. You know, if you've ever walked into, I'm sorry, elementary teachers out there, but an elementary classroom, a lot of them have gonzo decoration. Things hanging from the lights, things moving, things on the walls, everywhere. And, you, you know, imagine a kid with ADHD and they're just going to be like, what? <laughs> and yeah. Focus, boy, or girl, because it could be a girl, too. And, uh, yeah, good luck on that. So, uh, I don't want to do that with my channel. So, uh, anyway, I, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say their names, so I won't. But thank you for bringing that to my attention, because it, wow, really opened my eyes. Okay, on the topics I actually uh, wrote down for this week, um, one of them was... Uh, Kind of a takeoff on last week. So last week I talked about how, well, last week was just Montana. Certain states have said, uh, we're just not going to offer those unemployment benefits that the federal government lets us offer. We're just going to get rid of that whole extra money thing. And so last week was Montana. Well, this week a bunch more states, including North Dakota, joined in. Now, their argument was, okay, we, we just can't, we, we don't have enough workers, and uh, so we need to get people off unemployment. And, and I talked last week about why that isn't quite what the problem is. And I will say that in my own town, there's a restaurant right over there, and one right down there, both closed because they couldn't find workers. And there are restaurants all over town that have reduced hours because they can't find workers. 
but anyway, North Dakota joined in because, hey, why not? It's a red state. But uh, the point is, uh, they had... Uh, Okay, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Uh, the The point is, we, we had this problem before the pandemic. Now it's just a convenient excuse, because we can play small government conservative, and, uh, you know, the people that this applies to are just such a small voting minority that, who cares? We'll give them a big old finger. Not this finger. <laughs> but anyway, um, the the... The article I'm talking about this week, it's a... So last week I talked about how horrible it is working some of these jobs. So this week I read an article... Whoops. Read an article written by a... Um, it's, it's about a Starbucks barista. So Starbucks... We don't have any where I live, but we do have places to make coffee. Uh, posted an order that a person made for coffee that was just flipping insane. And yeah, that's what you're dealing with. And I will just tell you, I am a, give me a cup of coffee, black. That's me. It's miserable when you, you, you're, you decide, you're in the city and you decide to treat yourself to a nice cup of coffee. And you get stuck behind one of those people and you're just like, oh my God. Well, as the barista spends forever making their stupid little drink. And then, um, coffee, black. So, uh, this person posted the order, and, you know, I, I just thought that was a good point. Because, uh, yeah, it's, it's an inconvenience. And when I worked in food service, uh, some things, you know, just fine. You know, making pizzas, you put on whatever toppings. But when people would make these really complicated ice cream orders, when we're super busy, I'm just like, really? Do you see the line there? And you want this... Flip and Sunday with all these complicated toppings. Um, yeah, I hated that. So, I, I, I hear you. <laughs> I, I am so glad they posted that. Um, on other exciting news, to, tonight you saw my, uh, plat no, sorry, Senator President and uh, ODE posted a video this week which was just like the video i have wanted to make but have not been able to because i don't own one half of the pens he compared the senator president to the mobile 149 so i posted the link down below i'm not gonna do any spoilers because i think it's worth watching and i want you to watch it so yeah look down there for the uh, video from ODE. Uh, I have never owned a mobile 149. You did see two mobiles tonight, but uh, there's a reason I don't own the, the modern version. It has to do with dollars. Uh, and when I spend my channel income on pens, guess what's really low on my list of pens I want to try. So, uh, yeah. So I, I'm really glad that he did that. Another fun article I saw, which kind of leads into a new topic, but this article was so cool by itself, I just felt like I had to share it, was from Poland. And this was about an ant colony. It was on an old missile silo uh, in Poland, and these wood ants had built a colony kind of on top of it in one of the vents. And these wood ants build these huge colonies. They're quite impressive, so it's not like the ants around here. But... Anyway, every so often an ant would fall down, whoop, down the chimney into, or vent, down into the missile silo, where they were unable to get out. And what started happening with all these lost ants is they built a colony underground. Now, wood ants eat like sap and, you know, that kind of stuff. So these ants that were down below are like, well, what do we do now? Oh, wait. We've got dead ants. So they actually would eat the dead ants. The, you know, as ants died, they became food. They had them all organized. They would stack them. You know, just amazing organization. And so they were cannibals. Now, they de never developed a queen, and they're basically eating their own. So it's not like it was a self-sustaining colony, but uh, they survived. And by instinct, they continued a colony down below. 
Um, eventually, re other scientists said, you know, it's kind of mean to just leave him there. And the scientists at first like, but this is nature. Well, it's not quite nature because man caused this condition. So eventually a bridge was built, you know, basically a board that went up into the chimney. So if an ant fell down, he could crawl back up the board and get back to his colony. And yeah, the, the, the uh, cannibal colony down below emptied out and disappeared. And the ants that would fall down eventually found their way back up. But what an interesting idea. And, uh, you know, the writer in me is thinking, you know, what? how do human societies develop based on conditions that force them into it? And, well, we've got our answer because we, how many different human civilizations have lived on Earth? So I just thought that was a fascinating, fascinating article. And that led me to, what is it like to be a bee? And you're going to notice a whole string of articles that go through octopi, trees, uh, AI, bugs in general. So this week I did a book review of uh, Kevin J. Anderson's hit book, Hidden Empire. And I mentioned that his aliens just aren't really alien. And this string of articles talks about a whole bunch of species living on Earth, the same planet that evolved me. And yeah, I don't understand the mind of even a dog. We are surrounded by aliens. So to try to get inside the mind of an alien species, a truly alien species, that doesn't even have the same planet of origin in common with me, good luck. And I think the string of articles really does that really well. Uh, one of the things the string of articles does is it points out how we anthropomorphize animals. We ascribe human motivations to different animals. Even in the octopus article, they talk about how uh, a guy that ran the aquarium just flat out lied about what his octopus was doing just to make a good story. So, uh, I respect a science fiction author that can really, truly create an alien that feels alien. There have not been very many that, that succeeded. I think Arthur C. Clarke did in 2001. But how did he do it? By not trying to dive into the mind of the alien. They have a different mind. They come from totally different motivations. They are totally different from us. Um, trying to think of others, but uh, right at the moment, nothing else is coming to me. You know, you read uh, <clears throat> Tolkien or um, what's his name, Terry Brooks, and they have all kinds of different fantasy races. They're basically humans with bumps on their forehead. You know, the orcs and Tolkien are. Oh, they're bad, bad orc, bad orc. But it's not really an alien mind. It's just kind of a naughty human. And that really shows what a challenge it is to create true aliens. Uh, in my own writing, which maybe someday I'll publish, maybe someday I'll share, I have avoided aliens. Aliens exist. But I only mention them because I want to keep them alien. So, yeah, I just found that an interesting series of articles that right here on Earth, we are surrounded by aliens. What does it feel like to be a bee? Well, first of all, are bees self-aware enough to feel like anything? But, you know, and, and I think it's that article. They, they all ran together. but One of them kind of... Get, Talks about how roundworms are pretty much pre-programmed responses, whereas other animals, as you get high, uh, different places on the evolutionary ladder, uh, are, have a little bit more uh, independence. And that whole, where do we transition, is pretty gray. So, anyway, a very interesting series of articles. And then, while I was reading those articles, I ran into an article about Lebanon's train system. 
You've never heard of it? Neither had I. Uh, apparently Lebanon, the country, had quite an extensive train system at one point. It fell into disrepair and disuse, where it's all rusting away. And what's interesting about that is the whole discussion of why. Basically, people lost trust in their institutions. They lost trust in their government. And it scares me that I see that happening right here in this country. There, there's been talk of an infrastructure bill through several presidents of several different parties. Well, two, because there's really only two that have become president lately. And yet, nothing. No matter who is in charge, the other party tries to destroy it. Because, oh my god, we can't have the other party have even like a little Pyrrhic victory. And realize that the same things are coming to fruition here. I don't know what we can do about it, but another article I read this week kind of showed the problem. So, uh, Kevin McCarthy, who's uh, the minority leader in the, the House of Representatives, had a talk with President Joe Biden this week about the infrastructure bill. Immediately after he got out of that meeting, he immediately tweeted out a little something and called President Biden corrupt. Now, can we just talk about different people like I did with Mr. McCarthy, talking about what they say and do, rather than applying adjectives to them? Our, our whole political discussion has become so in, wrapped up in name-calling that it has become useless and ineffectual. It's all about, I'm going to get the other guy, rather than, what can I do to make the country better? Do we need an infrastructure bill? Majority of voters in this country say yes. Major a lot of experts say yes. Politicians on both sides say yes. But, oh, can we get together and come up with one? Oh, hell no. And, uh, why? Why? Because we can't let the party in power have a victory. And if we've got the ability to halt them from having any kind of a victory, we're going to do it. That's what happened in Lebanon. With some civil war and stuff thrown in there for good measure. Not in the United States, you say? Well, we already saw a group of people invade our capital to try to stop the certification of an election that had happened. They tried to stop somebody from becoming president after being voted for by a huge majority of voters. Heck, the last president became president even though he lost the popular election. So, um, yeah, that is a problem. And it scares me for the future of this country. And I don't have answers. I'm just scared. <laughs> In my other exciting news, I've got a couple of articles about COVID-19. And uh, first of all, good news. If you've been vaccinated, the CDC no longer says, you know, with a couple of narrow exceptions, that you need to wear masks indoors. So, so this guy may start enjoying life again. Maybe I'll see the inside of a restaurant again. Now, on to the bad news. A lot of states, like the one where I live, are struggling to get people to get vaccinated. Uh, they are struggling to get people to... And, and for varying reasons. Some people, it's just, well, I just don't know. And other people, you know, the, those are the vaccine hesitant. You know, they're, they're just kind of scared and they want to know more. And then you have absolutely not people. You know, the anti-vaxxers. Um... Ohio is actually giving away cash prizes to people who get vaccinated. Um, and a lot of it, 
there is serious misinformation out there. And it turns out that 65% of that misinformation is coming from 12 sort. That's not 12. 12 sources. Um, and what do you gain with that? And I have been reading reports about a major news network where certain co commentators, let's call them, are sp speaking out against vaccines, not with evidence, not with, hey, here's some science that's saying, whoa, just with questions. Well, I can ask questions, right? Well, questions um, aren't really arguments. They're not evidence. They're just an attempt to build up fear. Oh, when did you stop beating your wife? You know, that's a question. Uh, wait a second. I never did beat my wife. You know, and then you're dragged right down into the mud. So that's the kind of thing we're seeing. And then, of course, just deliberate wackadoodle misinformation. I talked to you last week about the school down in Florida. This, we will fire vaccinated teachers. And uh, kind of taking off from that, apparently some people who've been anti-mask are also anti-vaccination. And they're using masks to protect themselves from those of us like me who've been vaccinated. They're saying... Well, you're shedding proteins that make women have bad menstrual periods and you know, wh whatever. Silly. Nonsense. Not science-based. But you say it confidently enough, you repeat it enough, and people start to believe it. And uh, I do not know how you fight that. I see it in the students I teach. And I've learned, you know, you just don't get into those arguments. You don't get into those discussions. You just teach the science. You teach about evaluating evidence. You teach about the facts that are out there. And you just avoid, you do not get into those arguments. Because there is no winning those arguments. Because these people are not working off a rational basis. I'm totally okay with somebody who says, I just want more information with the vaccine. I'm not okay with these people who pull facts out of their hat or, you know, somewhere less YouTube appropriate. I don't know how to deal with them. So I'd love to know how. But anyway, those are the pens and inks I've been using th throughout this week. And... If videos like this interest you, where I talk about fountain pens and inks, both new and old, and at all price points, I would invite you to subscribe. And yes, I know I ranged on a whole bunch of topics, and feel free to comment on any of them, but what are your thoughts on... Oops, it's not doing it now. Oh, come on. Do the disco. <laughs> okay, what are your thoughts on the disco light? Unnes Dear God. This was supposed to be so dramatic, and I was going to, like, have an amazing light show going on behind me, but, yeah, that failed. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the disco light? Is the slow fade better? Should I go back to... Oops, wrong side. No, I was going to the right side. Should I go back to turning on the mission-style lamp as a... Uh, one viewer suggested. Uh, what about opening this up? Hey, it's just dark enough out there you can start to see stuff. Uh, let me know down in the comments because I, I am actually interested in that. I don't want my presentation to be a barrier. Now some things like, you know, I'd feel more comfortable if a woman did this video. Too bad! <laughs> but, uh, you know, some things, things that I can change that get in the way of viewers enjoying this channel I, I'd like to know so please leave a comment down below so I uh, thank you for watching we'll talk to you later bye bye